everyone and welcome to Your Money Story. I'm Renita Young, your host, and today is episode 21. I just realized that last week we made 20 episodes. How awesome. So today I want to talk about a very special topic. A lot of people have been reevaluating their lives, the impact they can make on this earth, and a lot of that may have to do with giving. And so today's guest, Shang Saavedra, she is a huge giver. In fact, she's the founder of Save My Sense on Instagram. And you can find out just how big of a giver is by the fact that she gives away the proceeds from Save My Sense. And so she and her husband have a plan to give in a really big way. And bonus, we're also going to talk about how your mental health impacts your personal financial health. So hang on for a moment and let me invite her on. Almost there. Hi, good morning to you. Hi, good morning. How are you, Shang? Am I I'm saying your name correctly, yes, Shang? Yeah, yeah, yeah you got okay. it right. It's Shang. You did great, it beautifully great. and happy Friday. <laughs> happy Friday. <laughs> this is good. You know what? I love this topic. I love talking about giving and the different ways people can give and the different ways people interpret, you know, what's best for them. But we want to start out with your money story. Now you grew up, you came from a farmer's family and the, your family survived the cultural revolution in China. And so yeah. I need to know what was your relationship like with money growing up? Thankfully, pretty healthy because my parents bore the brunt of that sort of rags to riches story where they survived the Cultural Revolution. They decided to leave their home country and emigrate outwards. We first started living in Europe and then moving to the United States when I was 10 years old. And my parents took a lot of care to make life seem as normal and happy and safe as they could make it while my dad was hustling his butt yeah. to become a world famous professor. Mm -hmm. And he did that and together your parents were able to pay for your college cash. Um, there, yeah. there are still not a whole lot of people uh, to say that in this world. And so you met your husband at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. By the way, I'm from Chicago. Yes. <laughs> Been on that campus plenty of times. Um, yeah. and. I need to know, when did you kick your frugal living into high gear? Yep. It was actually around the same time as when I started business school. Okay. I'd always been lucky that I learned to live on less than I made. That was something that I learned from my parents because my parents, in order to pay for my college in cash, they were frugal mm -hmm. and they saved pennies. They tracked their spending. So I did the same thing. When I entered business school, I actually had originally a goal of being an entrepreneur. And I knew that in the beginning, you're going to have a ramen life. So I learned to adopt <laughs> that ramen life and to work really hard, but live on very little. And then so I started paring back my lifestyle. And this was both hitting the needs, as in the housing that I chose to live in, as well as the wants, such as how much I wanted to travel or spend on fashionable clothes. Okay, very good. Um, so you got to control over that in a big way before you had the big salary that could buy mm -hmm. all these things. Um, and so by the time you and your husband got married, you guys moved to Mid Manhattan, the heart of Manhattan. Yes. Um, and you were able to become work optional by the time you were 31. Take yeah. us through how you did that, how you and your husband were able to manage that with the two incomes. Yep. Um, as I was starting to become more frugal and my husband and I were talking about marriage, he said, what if we exited the two income trap forever? And I was like, tell me more. And he said, when people combine the finances and they get married, they get used to a household with two incomes and you inflate your lifestyle. And, and then you kind of work for the market, work for the kids, work for the cars for the rest of your life. And he didn't want that. Mm -hmm. He wanted at least one of us to be able to be home if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. And then, so he said, let's learn to live on the lower of our two incomes. Our incomes are pretty similar, but there was one that was lower. So when we moved to New York City, we did. We learned to live off the lower of the two incomes and it was hard work to do yeah. that. We were lucky that we were paid pretty well 
um, but still, you know, tiny apartment, mm -hmm. not the best apartment. New York City, the expensive. <laughs> you know? It is. It is. It is. Okay, yeah. and and then eventually, um, you guys say that you have big philanthropy dreams. Yeah. What are your big philanthropy dreams? Yep. So we save and invested those savings. The investing part is really important. And then now it's incredible because we're seeing our investments grow by six figures each year, which is Good. insane. I could not have imagined this abundance. Um, we both believe really strongly that after a certain point, there just isn't much to life on spending a lot of money on yourself. Like you don't mm. get that much more happiness out of it. We see people with beautiful cars and beautiful lifestyles. We think that brings happiness. I've had a taste of that. It doesn't. It mm. doesn't make you any happier. And that's when we started committing to philanthropy and giving the money away, giving the money to people who could use it a lot more than we need. And when we started doing more and more of that, I realized that's actually what brought me joy and brought me happiness in life. That's pretty good. But I remember you saying that you have a big dream. You guys have mm -hmm. a bigger philanthropy dream. And I, I, I want you to walk us through how you started in a moment. But take, take us to the big dream first. Big dream is by the time that we are dead, but hopefully throughout our lifetime, all excess wealth that we generate would be given away. And that that's the big dream. Wow, that's huge. And, you know, with someone who has accounts growing at six figures every year, mm -hmm. um, that must be a lot to give. That will create a lot of change, you know? It will. Um, and so you say to start small. Um, if I'm a person who maybe I make the median income in New York City, maybe I have expenses, but I do want to make sure I give. Uh, yeah. Tell me how I can start. When I first started with my first paycheck, I also didn't give all that much. Um, I, I am a Christian, so I go to church and I uh, tithe to the church, but I didn't tithe like the full 10 percent. I tithe some. Mm -hmm. And I started volunteering. You can give your time, too. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be money. I started by giving my time, uh, volunteering, um, and sometimes you can give in kind. So, mm -hmm. for example, if there's like a bake sale, you, you like contribute baking to it. Yeah. And over time, you start to see how much joy that is. And, and then you start thinking, wow, okay, I can do this. And, mm -hmm. and that's sort of where I built it up. But I, I didn't give as much as I do now, even relative to my income mm -hmm. when I was much younger. Okay, got it, got it. And so you said you started giving like 5% of your income before moving to 10% over a few mm -hmm. years. And like you said, the goal is to give away all your excess wealth. Um, and you also, you give the proceeds from Save My Sense Away already. Yes. My goodness, you're already halfway there. And so thank you also for taking me through the different ways that people can give. Um, because mm -hmm. many folks may think it's a little intimidating. Um, but I really appreciate you running through that. And so along with this conversation of giving, when you are talking to people, you also talk about how mental health impacts your personal financial health. And so oh tell gosh, me, yeah. yeah, I mean, really, we could probably have a whole, a whole show on this alone. But like, what's, what's the big grand thought about that, you know, and then break it down for people who, who can't make the connection just yet. Yeah, your mental health and financial health are literally intertwined. Because what we manifest comes from our beliefs about ourselves. So when mental health is poor, we often also have a twisted or just like not the healthiest, most positive view about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then we make choices that can be more short-sighted, maybe shoot ourselves in the foot in the long run, mm -hmm. just panicky decisions that then lead to likely chaos in our financial life. Mm -hmm. And so one of the best ways to turn around your financial situation is to actually get your mental health treated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so how would you suggest someone, let's say they have to make a big money decision, um, what are some ways to like care for your mental health while you're doing this or even just while you're budgeting for everyday life? Yeah, yeah. All too often what I found from the people that I coach is that we miscategorize self-care as spending 
on ourselves, and that's、mm. not necessarily always the case.、Okay. Self care could mean taking more naps. Free. It could、okay. mean walking, <laughs> taking a walk, and and getting some exercise in you. It could mean talking to a friend. Okay.、Um, it can also mean spending some money, but it doesn't have to be a lot. Okay. And the more that we build those kind of activities in, we're bringing happy chemicals into our bodies, and that translates to better mental health over time. Okay. You know what? There's this thing out called revenge spending, where <laughs> because everything is opening back up. Um, people, it's it's kind of like you know, oh, I'm getting back at the year that I had to spend in quarantine, and so I would imagine that you have some guidance around that too. Be careful how people can be careful with revenge spending. How can they?、Mm-hmm. Yeah,、um, you don't want to revenge spend and then get a hangover from your spending. <laughs> that that's really important, right?、Um, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> it is. I often like to say.、Uh, Show me somebody's stack of receipts, and I'll show you what their priorities are. What you spend on, what you put your、mm. resources to, is where your priorities lie. So, if you imagine yourself to value one thing, but then your receipts tell a really different story,、mm. then you're not spending according to your values. And at the end of the day, I'm not going to tell you you got to spend more on this and less on that. No, I would like you to feel aligned within yourself by saying. You know, I spend on the things that I value, and that value-driven spending philosophy is something that just takes a little bit of time to step back and look at what you're spending, look at what you plan to spend, and say, "Am I happy with this plan? Do I think、yeah. this fulfills the dreams that I have?" Very, very good advice. Very practical and clear advice because some people, it's it's almost like. You have to keep the big goal in mind with everything you spend, every little thing that you spend.、Um, yeah. And I see we have a lot of comments. We don't have a whole bunch of questions in here, but what I would ask you as a wrap-up question,、um, I know that you and you you hope to help solve the debt crisis. Um, that everyday Americans are facing, and that's a huge passion of yours.、Um, and so, tell me, what do you think is the number one most important thing that people who are in deep debt, maybe it's college loan, maybe it's consumer debt, what is the first thing that they can do、um, to work toward paying off their debt? Yeah, it's actually not an act that's financial; it's an act that's emotional.、Hmm. I'd like you. If you're beating yourself up about your debt, to forgive yourself right now, because、mm. your debt doesn't define who you are. You're not defined by as someone who carries this this burden, this this debt. Right? It could have come from many different reasons, many of which are very normal, because not everyone comes from a family that's lucky to have their parents pay for their、mm. debt, and some people fall in hard times. On accidents, we have to put the healthcare bills on the credit card, and it just spirals.、Mm-hmm. So it's not your it's not your fault. It doesn't define you. Forgive yourself, and once we forgive ourselves, we love ourselves into abundance, and from there we get the strength and the courage to start making the choices to pay down those debts. Wow, I think that is a lovely place to close on. <laughs> I mean, really. What hope for people who do have six-figure debt, though? Right, you know, the, which there, you know, we always hear the statistic about student loan debt that it's around thirty-five thousand dollars average. I have no, I know, you know, of way more instances. You know, people who have gone to、uh, postgraduate degree programs, and、um, what hope for people in those situations as well as others? Shang, thank you so much. For joining us, and folks, if you would like to learn more about Shang Savitra and Save My Sense, make sure you click over to Save My Sense. And I see one person asking, "Will this live be saved?" Absolutely, it will. So you can check it out at the Quick Take channel under the Your Money Story section. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, Shang. It's been a pleasure. I hope to keep in touch. Thank Have you. Have a lovely Friday. You too. Happy weekend. Happy weekend. Bye bye. Bye.